All right, well, let's go ahead and jump in. Thank you everybody for joining to our Hacking HR event, People Analytics, making it work for you and your business. To kick things off, I'm gonna turn it over to Devin, who's gonna talk a little bit about Hacking HR. Thank you. Yep, my name is Devin Michael, um, one of the people that get to plan this great event. Um, and I hope you guys are super excited about what we're about to learn to, about today. Uh, Hacking HR is a global um, group of individuals that are at the intersection of HR, technology, and consulting, and all interested in the future of work. And so um, this is a group here in Indianapolis, but also it's a, like I said, a global group with a a lot of locations throughout the globe. Um, but yeah, so I, I want to kick it back over to Amanda so she can introduce our lovely speakers for the day. Wonderful. Thank you, Devin, for sharing a little bit about Hacking HR and our global reach there. To get started, we will let the panelists actually introduce themselves. So to kick things off, I will turn it over to Brad. Hi, good evening, afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Brad Karcher. I am with a company called Vizier, which is a people analytics platform utilized by enterprise organizations to uh, purpose their people data in profoundly different ways in order to improve the performance of their business. I have uh, been in the HR and uh, HR technology <laughs> space for quite some time, as you can see on the slide here. Uh, spending time with uh, organizations such as uh, First Advantage and Oracle, um, everything from uh, talent acquisition technologies to screening technologies that touch base with things like background verifications, drug testing, work opportunity tax credits, and then during my time at Oracle uh, with their HCM platform. And uh, I've been with Vizier for about four years at this point in time, so very delighted to be with the group today. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. And next, let's learn a little bit about Nate. Nate, over to you. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Amanda. My name is Nate Schultz. I'm here in Indianapolis. Um, my background is in IO psychology, so I have a master's degree from IUPUI. Um, out of grad school, I joined a local tech firm and uh, focused heavily on organizational development, so learned lots about leadership development, performance management, employee engagement, and sort of owning the employee engagement process at that company led me to fall in love with the field of people analytics, which is why I'm here today. And um, spent uh, the next portion of my career in healthcare actually. So made the transition from tech to healthcare where we focused um, really heavily on topics like first year turnover, diversity and inclusion, um, talent acquisition. And um, just recently, so I think I hit my two month anniversary just a few days ago, actually, I transitioned over to um, Tableau, which is now a, a part of Salesforce. And at Tableau, our mission is to help people see and understand data. And so I'm on the people analytics team at Tableau, slowly but surely integrating into the larger Salesforce team. So thank you for having me today and thanks for joining. Perfect, thank you, Nate. And our third panelist for the night is Nayeli. So we'll turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, so my background is in HR. I have been working in HR pretty much since I graduated back in 2009. Um, I have been in psychometric testing, interviewing, recruiting, reporting, and then that evolved to people analytics. Um, I'm currently working on my MBA, which has given me a great uh, vision of how the expenses in people um, really impact the business and how also we can get resources for our HR initiatives so that we, we can create a better work environment for our employees. Perfect. Thank you, Nayeli. All right. I'm going to stop sharing our slide deck now. So let's, to get started, let's really talk about what, um, as we jump into this, let's talk about what the people analytics mean. So, you know, what does this mean to you? What isn't it? So Nayeli, we'll turn, we'll start off with you. I love this question. So, uh, Nate and I actually met 
before this meeting just to kind of like um, get on the same page of what is people analytics, right? And so we were debating like, what is it? And so truly it is the practice or the method of using data to make decisions that impact employees. Um, so anytime that you are using data to create insights and, and meaningful, make meaningful decisions, then that is what we consider people analytics. Great, thank you. Nate, anything you'd like to add there? Um, yeah, just to, to sort of supplement Nielli's point, I think for me, people analytics is just, as long as we're uh, focused on improving the employee experience using data, I think we can define it as people analytics. One thing, one quote sort of resonates and I don't know who to give credit to who said this quote, but I like it nonetheless. Um, is data is useless unless it leads to insights and insights are useless unless they lead to action. And that's where I think people analytics, a really successful people analytics team, um, that's their value add is taking sort of static reporting and you know sharing just basic descriptive statistics to the business to really interpreting and analyzing the data in a way that, that leads to action. That's the tricky part, but I think that's where people analytics can have the most value add. Perfect, great. And Nate, continuing with you, um, why do you think the topic of people analytics has become so, has become such a hot topic? Yeah, I um, I thought a lot about this question, and I think there's probably a myriad of answers. But the one um, uh, how I was thinking about this was uh, similar to the way I know Josh Burson has talked about this a lot. It's just over the years, as companies have sort of ward over talent and focus more heavily on hiring and keeping critical talent, the need for data and understanding what makes a really great employee experience to keep talent um, is at the forefront of, of leaders' minds. And I think additionally, over the last decade or so, I think research that is now what would be now considered, you know, people analytics in like the IO psychology space has become more accessible. I think not just in academia anymore, you see research being published in sort of more mainstream news outlets. And I think that's made leaders and businesses more aware of sort of the potential consequences of not using data when it comes to decision-making around people. So bad hiring decisions leading to costly turnover. So I think as companies have become more aware of the potential costs and consequences of not making really good decisions with data, I think they've invested more heavily in it. Good, thank you for that. Brad, anything you want to add to why the, this um, topic has become such a hot button? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think um, much of it um, is actually um, a byproduct of a business environment that we all are in today, where data is prevalent and pervasive throughout an organization. And quite frankly, you know, different parts of organizations have had a big head start in terms of, of the importance and the use of data to make decisions. So examples would be your finance organization is using data on a regular basis to help chart the course for investments that they might make into the organization where they might make you know, recommendations for changes from an operational perspective based on costs. Uh, sales organizations have reams of data that talk about sales performance and the relationship between sales and customer engagement, for instance. And then if you look at uh, marketing organizations, especially if you look at organizations that have made big strides towards digital transformation, the kind of information that they are able to capture and purpose and make really strong decisions for have all been precursors. And unfortunately for many HR organizations, they have been a bit on the sideline with that kind of information. And so HR with the proverbial looking for a seat at the table has struggled a bit to demonstrate their value, their full value proposition. And I think the other piece is that for HR in particular, they've historically just looked at data to <clears throat> put it in the perspective of HR effectiveness, not HR impact. And quite frankly, HR impact comes from looking at people data in the context of specific key performance indicators within the organization, whether that's revenue, whether that's productivity, whether that's 
customer, uh, customer satisfaction, you know, whatever those key measures are for your business, ultimately linking that back to people in some way to influence what the performance of the organization looks like. That's really, I think, where many of the drivers are coming from. It's prevalent in everything that organizations are doing today. H HR is finally getting to the point where they're using profound information to help influence the performance of the organization. Yeah, thank you for that, Brad. Um, and I'll pause here just for a minute. I do want to encourage any of the, the folks joining us tonight, you know, utilize the chat feature if you have any questions and we'll, we'll work to, to answer questions um, and, and have our panelists answer questions towards the end. So I encourage you to, to use the chat feature. Um, next, let's talk about, um, you know, having our panelists provide some examples of people analytics that your business focus on, focus on and why. And Nayeli, we'll start with you and then Nate will go to you. Yeah, so in, in my company, which is healthcare, uh, we are very focused on productivity. So we want to know um, that we are staffing our communities properly so we can take care of our residents. And also we want to make sure that we are scheduling our employees um, all the time that they are willing to work. So we, we have a full-time employee, well, let's make sure that we schedule them full-time instead of just partial hours. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so I can provide some examples here too. So um, I'll probably spend most of my time referencing examples from my experience in healthcare. And previously, I'll, I'll, you know, of course, incorporate Tableau examples as they're relevant. But I'm still a newbie by all accounts. Um, so in in healthcare, our people analytics team focus really on the entire employee life cycle. So starting from hiring all the way to when somebody exits the organization. We were fortunate um, to have company strategic goals that focused on people. So that made our job as people analytics professionals a little bit easier and knowing where to focus our attention. And so in healthcare, um, first year turnover is of sort of is on everybody's mind. At COVID has sort of you know changed the game from a turnover perspective, but pre-COVID. Um, not just the organization I was with, but, but healthcare organizations in general were focused on how can we reduce our first year turnover? So, so you know, uh, the number of people that leave before they hit their one year anniversary. And there's a myriad of reasons why we would focus on this. One is we want to create great experiences for the people that work at our organization. But two is um, we want to put people in positions where they can be successful. And if somebody's not with us for a full year, sort of our takeaway is that they were in the, they were in the wrong role and we didn't give them a chance to be successful. And then it's extremely costly too, because it takes people months and months to ramp up. And then, you know, they're only productive for maybe a few months before they end up leaving the organization. And not everyone leaves at, at the full year mark either. They might leave at two months, right? And that counts as first year turnover. So how can we reduce that? Um, I think it was sort of, we were fortunate, like I said, in that we had a strategic goal focusing on that. So we could sort of wrap, you know, really focus our attention so that we were delivering the most value for our business at that time. Um, so that was sort of a healthcare example. And then switching to sort of my Tableau Salesforce experience where first year turnover isn't an issue at all. And so we focus um, on much different areas of the employee life cycle, specifically lately, really taking a sort of uh, inequality lens to everything that we do throughout the employee life cycle. So um, when we look at our hiring analytics, ensuring that we're seeing, you know, for the representation goals that we have at our organization, are we sourcing, you know, enough talent to meet those goals, just as an example. Um, so it's varied on the industry that I've been in, but ultimately trying to align those initiatives with what the company's focused on. Perfect. Thank you for that. Hey, Amanda, can I, I'll just jump in just for a second on this topic. Yeah. Too, because um, I think uh, Nate, Nate and Ailey are spot on here, but you know, one of the things that we're seeing in our customer base is um, not only a focus on the the diversity and inclusion topic, which is you know just so critical for so many organizations and so uh, top of mind uh, and rightly so for organizations, 
but it, it's it's more than just what is what is my diversity look like from a number standpoint in an organization. Um, and Ailey may agree with me when I say this, but particularly in um, healthcare organizations where they're trying to do a better job of mirroring their employee population based on a specific location. Nate, you may recall this too from IU, uh, IU Health, where they're trying to, to be more respectful of the, the patients in this case and that the, the workforce really better mirrors what, what, the, what the patient composition looks like in, in the community that they're in. So there's some big focus there from a people analytics perspective. I think the other thing that we're seeing a lot of would be organizations that are trying to move towards more predictive analytics. So the notion of not only looking at what has happened in the past, but how do I analyze that data in, in patterns that are associated with that to try to tell the story about what is likely to happen in the future so that you can inform your leadership better about what potentially will happen. And even more so, put yourself in a position where if we believe that this is going to happen, are there things that we can do and change right now in order to prevent those things from occurring as the case might be. So we see um, a lot of that kind of information out there. And then the third thing I'll add on this topic is that we see more and more organizations that are looking at people analytics through the lens of the skills of the people within their organization. So trying to get a good sense of what's the composition of the skills in the organization today, because I think all of us, regardless of the maybe the industry that we're in, can understand that the skills that you have today in your organization may not be all the skills that you need for success in the future. And so the only way to really to, to chart your, your the path of your organization correctly, particularly when you're trying to acquire new talent, is to make sure you understand the composition of skills within your organization and the risk of losing those skills for the future. So even things that might be somewhat simplistic, if you will, well, what percentage of my organization is in the zone for retirement and what skills do that retired population have and how do I prepare for succession or training, as the case might be, as those people naturally attrit out of the organization? So those are three areas that I think I see, you know, where businesses are beginning to take you know, new chapters as far as people analytics is concerned. Perfect. Thank you for that. So we've talked about the types of people analytics. So now let's dive into some of the tools. What tools do you all um, produce with people analytics today and what are the pros and cons of them? So Nate, if you'll start us off and then we'll go to Niley and then Brad. Yeah, happy to. So um, in the past, I've been fortunate to stay pretty tool agnostic. So in other words, um, I've had sort of tools um, that are available to me and I can sort of pick and choose based on the given situation. Uh, mostly though, I use Tableau, um, even at my previous organizations to get to know the data first. I think Tableau is extraordinarily powerful in visualizing sort of getting the lay of the land of the data that you're working with. Um, and it's cool to see, you know, Tableau eat their own dog food, so to speak, um, and use Tableau for everything uh, that, that we do in the analytics space. Um, I think the pro to this tool is that it's incredibly intuitive. Um, like I said, it makes sort of getting the lay of the land of your data really easy. I think in people analytics, especially, Brad sort of alluded to this in the beginning of the call, but you know, we're dealing with data that's typically employee focused in nature, but might be in a bunch of disparate sources all over the organization. And they're never in the same system. And so Tableau also has a really um, powerful data processing sort of arm where you can join those data sets together to start sort of like making sense of all these different things that are happening across the organization. Um, the cons of Tableau are there aren't any. No, I'm just joking. Um, I think this is, uh, this is not Tableau specific, but I'm just gonna talk about sort of BI data visualization tools in general. I think people analytics professionals, I'm definitely, I, I've certainly been guilty of this in the past with the power to create really aesthetically pleasing and cool graphs, um, we tend to get really overexcited and then just instead of reporting, you know, static numbers like we used to, we just report a bunch of different graphs and we leave it up to the business to kind of sift through them and interpret what to derive out of that. And so it's like a, it's like a, 
it's a tricky situation because you can over graph people, right? You can just, and then you're, and then you're telling them nothing. Back to the quote um, that I was saying in the beginning, we, we need to help make the link between insight and action a lot clearer to be successful in people analytics. Um, another tool that I wanted to mention that I use because I think it's, um, if you follow people analytics forums and stuff like that, or, or, or uh, sort of like thought leaders in the space, you hear a lot about R as a, as a statistical analysis tool for, for AI machine learning type projects as well. I like using R as kind of like a second step to Tableau and maybe we're trying to understand more specifically, are there you know, statistically significant relationships between maybe data sets that we're looking at? So um, you know, maybe we hypothesize there's differences in how new hires during COVID experience onboarding compared to new hires pre-COVID. Um, I'm sure there's functionality in Tableau that I am just not aware of yet, but R makes it a little bit easier to, to, to run that statistical analysis and be a little bit more confident that maybe differences you're seeing are not due to chance, if you will. Um, the pros of R are that it's free and there's a gazillion online resources to try and learn it. And then the cons are, it's not easy to learn. I'm certainly no expert. Um, fortunately, now I have a bunch of colleagues that are much more talented than I and are, and I can lean on them. Um, so although there's lots of free resources, it's not, you know, it doesn't have that intuitive user experience like, like Tableau does. It's just a, a blank slate and then your code essentially. So, um, so that, those are sort of the two that I just wanted to mention though. All right, Nayeli? Well, I'm gonna go with a competition with Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> Just because, I mean, who doesn't use Excel? I feel like a lot of people that create reports in each chart, um, you just use Excel, right? So Excel is a great tool uh, to create reports um, because it's just, easy to use, you can find a lot of resources in like how to do anything, right? You can just Google how to do this, how to do that in Excel, and you're just gonna find a lot of resources that are gonna tell you how to do whatever you're trying to achieve. The downside of Excel is that it's a point and click. You can automize some of the steps, but most of the time, like you have to, again, point and click, do all the steps to, to be able to reproduce your analysis. Um, so the next step of that is Power BI. So I really like Power BI because they have been really good at just making it easy to use. Uh, just like Nate mentioned, like I use R for a statistical analysis and the fact that you can even connect R to Power BI and create or do your analysis in, in Power BI directly, that is just amazing. You can connect to a lot of different sources. You can atomize the cleaning steps of your data with Power Query. Um, and you can find a lot of resources too to learn how to use it. So I really like this too. Um, the downside of Power BI is that, just to be honest, like the charts are not as pretty as Tableau. <laughs> Tableau does have better visuals, uh, but also if you compare visuals from R to Power BI, I mean, that is like a step up, <laughs> right? Because if you have ever seen charts from R, it's kind of like those like black and white charts or like weird colors that you find on like scientific articles, right? It's just like, we're, like they're not pretty. So in that case, you can use Power BI or Tableau. So those are the two, the, the two tools that I use for uh, data analytics and visualization. And I just find them like very helpful. Um, like Power BI, something that really amazed me is that now they are uh, embedding AI in Power BI, so you can like feed your data set to uh, the program, and then it can tell you what statistical analysis it recommends for your data set. 
So I just thought that it was like amazing um, because, you know, having to study like several semesters to learn about statistical analysis and then having just like you pull your data and then it tells you, oh, you might want to use this algorithm or this analysis or this analysis. So it's like, well, that's pretty handy. <laughs> Um, so yeah, those, those two, um, if you're starting with people analytics, you can find a lot of resources. Um, Keith McNold, I recommend following him in LinkedIn. He posts a lot of uh, helpful, uh, he even wrote a book about people analytics and he gives you the code and like how to, how to analyze, how to do a regression analysis for um, I think it was like turnover. So those kind of things in, if you want to learn R, like Nate said, it's not user-friendly, but there are several websites where you can learn it. Uh, my favorite is DataCam because you can just uh, use their interface that is very similar to R and you can learn it. Perfect. Well, thank you for that. Brad, anything you want to add about the tools? Um, well, I, I would preface my comments by saying uh, whatever, whatever the tool is, is probably predicated on who the organization is, the size of the organization, and what they actually want to try to accomplish with it. So there is absolutely no one size fits, uh, fits all. I mean, both Nate and Naley have, have given really great responses in terms of visualization tools and very, you know, common tool like a like an Excel spreadsheet to be able to capture information. You know, I think I think the the important thing is that that putting data together is useless unless people do something profound with it. So it doesn't really matter what the tool is if you're not capturing what's coming out of that information and doing something with it. So you can have the greatest tool in the world, but if you don't have a culture that is hungry to do something profound with that information, it doesn't really matter what that looks like. Now, that being said, clearly I have somewhat of a bias, but my bias is, uh, you know, Vizier's technology, which is designed primarily for enterprise-sized organizations, right? Thousands of employees within an organization. And one of the differentiating factors between uh, the, the uh, business intelligence tools um, that are being described is Vizier already has the pre-built content, the pre-built metrics and the pre-built calculations. So basically is it's, a, it's, a, it's an HR data model that's ready to accept the data. And once the data comes in, it already knows what kinds of questions can be answered using that data, regardless of you know, how many different sources of that data will, will be leveraged. And so one of the differentiations would be, of course, is that you would not need significant amount of, of technical background or learning to get up to speed you know, with, with visualizing information. I think the second piece that goes with it is Nate mentioned this a moment ago, and that is if you can't tell a story with the data, you're going to have a lot of people that either interpret it the incorrect way um, or don't use it the way that you would have as the, the collector and the assembler of that information, the way that you would have thought that they would have used um, the information. I guess the third piece would be as you think about a tool and technology, I think you should think about it on who the, who the consumers of that information will be and how you distribute that information to that. Because one of the things that if you're already not in people analytics or data in general, that you're going to find are people that are gonna question the security of the information and whose eyeballs can touch that information. And so if you're distributing Excel spreadsheets, you always have to be cautious about who touches that inf information and whose eyeballs can fall into that information. So I would put, place those three things in there, right? Pre-built content, storytelling, and the, and the ability to distribute or what, what we refer to as data democratization. How do I share this in as secure manner as possible? That, that will help dictate what's the right kind of tool strategy for you. Perfect. Thank you, Brad, for wrapping that up.
Can, so can I ask a follow-up question to Brad? Do you mind? Oh, sure. <laughs> I'm, just curious okay. about, I'm just curious about his, his year. Um, oh. Brad, would you say, because Naeli and I both shared cons of the tools that we mentioned, I'm curious from your perspective, is like the, I'm not going to call it a con. It's not yeah, a con, no, no, I like, do. Um, would just be this, it's it's good for enterprise size, but maybe smaller companies wouldn't wouldn't get the same benefit. Well, that's exactly it. it, right? So that's okay. why I led my comments with, it's designed for an enterprise-sized yeah. organization. So the natural piece is, if you're a smaller organization, the investment into a, a pre-built technology like Vizier may, may not be you know cost-justified back to an organization. And I think that would be, potentially the, the, the con that goes with it. The other con would be, look, for some organizations, they have technologists, they have data analysts within their organization that are generating or could generate some of this. And they already own things like a Tableau that is being used for other purposes within their organization. So the ability to repurpose or purpose portions of that towards people analytics for some organizations, that makes just perfect sense from an economics and from a from a uh, organizational structure perspective in terms of resources. So it's a good, it's a super legit call out. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Dad, that's Brad, that's an interesting point because you know, part of the organization I work with, we have a, a tech group and they recently built me a people analytics tool. Yeah. So it's 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 interesting that you, you bring that up. So we've talked about the, the tools, we've talked about the type of people analytics. So let's dive into the consumers. So um, I wanna jump into who are the consumers of the people analytics in your organization and how do they use this information to make business decisions? So Nayeli, if we can start with you and then go to Nate. Sure, so in my case, in anyone that is making decisions about their workforce, those are my consumers. Um, so we have, in our case, we have a, an administrator in each of our communities, and we have a HR business partner in each of our communities. So all of them require analytics that allow to see if, for example, how is the retention going, right? Like if they need to have like different programs, like sign up bonuses that are uh, like the fair, you know, they get like a part of it when they start and then they get another part at 90 days or whatever they decide. But all that information is helpful for them to see like, is that bonus actually making a difference? Like, do we need to, uh, you know, maybe make it like longer? Like, what do we need to do, right? So that's like really important for them. And then of course, then you have your HR director and benefits, benefits was like fascinating for me because that was one of my first projects when I started this company. Um, like really, uh, who is signing up for bonus, for benefits? Um, you know, if it was like salary people, hourly people, um, how long they were with the company, um, because then you have your waiting period for benefits. And then we also had our retirement plan. Right, so how long do we have to wait for them to be able to enroll into a retirement plan? Like, is it worth it to give them access to a retirement plan within 30 days when we have you know, a lot of people leaving within 30 days or should we wait longer? So all those kind of decisions like were made like on, on data. And so that, that was really helpful. And so, yeah, I would say like anyone making decisions about people about their workforce, um, so you have HR and operations, basically. All right, Nate? Yeah, so I think the way that I wanted to approach answering this question was sort of with an analogy that I like to use about how I think about people analytics, which is like, we want to think about people analytics in terms of sort of like your car dashboard. So we want to make it easy for people to know the KPIs that they care about, how they're doing in all of them. Could be hiring, could be turnover, could be whatever, but it's a quick glance and you kind of look at it, you say, okay, things look good. And then you and then you leave. And that's kind of like your operational folks might look, look, look at those dashboards on an ongoing basis. But then there's also like in a car dashboard, your check engine light, which it comes on, you know, there's a problem. 
but you don't know what it is, right? It requires some further diagnosis. And so you've been alerted that there's a problem, but you might need somebody to take a, take a deeper look, right? And tell you what's going on. And I think that's kind of where people analytics can really add a lot of value as like BI tools become more sort of like uh, popular and um, available. It's become easier just to put data up on a screen and then have people look at it every once in a while. It's still really hard to take the data and diagnose what's going on and recommend action. So um, I, the second part of this question, which is how do people use the information to make business decisions? The answer is they don't if you don't make it easy for them to know what to do about it. They won't come back. Um, you know, if they ask you a big question like, why is our first year turnover so high? And you give them a bunch of graphs that show termination trending and stuff like that, they're going to say, okay, you know, never mind. I'm not interested. Um, and so I, I've never met somebody that uh, would prefer to not have like the so what along with the what, right? So I think it's our job as people analytics professionals to kind of, as Brad was mentioning too, it's like linking insight to action. And it's just so critical if we want people to continue to use um, sort of the outputs that we're providing. You know, Amanda, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's you know, I've been thinking about this question. Um, the consumers of people analytics may not just be people within your own organization also. And if you're a publicly traded organization these days, there's actually requirements that the SEC is mandating for organizations to share specific kinds of information about the composition of your workforce. And so it also becomes an element of, of decisions that individual investors or cap, capital organizations make in terms of making purchases for stock within your organization. And we're gonna see more and more of that going forward, particularly in the area of diversity and inclusion as, uh, as people make stock and investing decisions based on what their personal beliefs may be. And, and the composition of a workforce uh, can be a, a major influencing factor for some people. So I just thought I'd throw that in. It just doesn't have to be within your own organization. Right. Thank you for that. So let's kind of flip what we've been talking to on its side a little bit and let's discuss what are some of the biggest challenges that you've faced in incorporating people analytics as part of your operational culture. So Nate, if we'll, we'll start with you, then Nayeli, and then finish up with Brad. Yeah, I think there's, you know, we could probably spend the remainder of this call on this question alone um, because there's many, especially with people analytics being kind of a new field, right? It just looks different in, in every organization. But what I wanted to answer this question with was, um, uh, you, you might get, a bunch of requests, which is great, from your um, leaders and from your executives uh, asking for data, um, which having an appetite for data in your organization is, is awesome. That's amazing. Um, it's been it's challenging though, because um, you might get a really urgent request of we need X, Y, and Z, and we need it by tomorrow. Um, balancing with balancing, you know, um, executing that request with what are, what is the the primary what is the question you're trying to ask and backing up and always approaching sort of the request for data with the question in mind. So what do you wanna be able to say with the data that we're gonna provide you basically? And I think that can slow things down um, in the short term, but in the long term, it helps people sort of rethink how they approach data related problems. So thinking about the big question instead of just the data elements that you might need, because oftentimes people don't know what they don't know, right? They might not be aware of um, some other area of the business that's already answered that question, or they might not be aware that we have certain data to help answer that question. So just approaching every problem with what's the question we're trying to answer and what's the insight that you're hoping to derive. I think you nailed it, honestly. That's, that's huge right there. Naily, anything you want to add there? What are what are challenges that you that you faced? I think credibility, mm -hmm. uh, having to establish because, like Nate mentioned, people analytics is kind of like a new field, 
if you know we compare it with other fields or other sciences. So it, sometimes when you are working in an organization that is still working towards being a data-driven organization, uh, then you have to prove that your data is valid and that your insights are credible, right? And then the whatever uh, data points that you are using are reliable, you know, are they are accurate. So that's, that's one of the biggest challenges that I have found. They like, you just have to prove that you're accurate, reliable, and you're credible. So those, those are the biggest challenges that I have faced just because it's something that kind of new. Perfect, thank you for that. Brad, what about you? Well, I'll just, uh, I, I agree with Naomi on that. Credibility is, is huge, especially if you get out of the gate sideways, so to speak. It's very difficult to circle back and, and get everybody back in your camp again a second time, or a second time around. And part, and part of that credibility sometimes for organizations is that, that, and Nate mentioned this earlier, you've got data that's in disparate locations. So you're trying to figure out a way to bring it together in a, uh, in a um, as, as easy and as singular manner as you possibly can. But inherent in that, especially early on in a people analytics journey, a lot of that data can be seen, we use this term dirty data, right? It just, it doesn't, it doesn't line up the right way across all these data sources. And so for some organizations, they spend a disproportionate amount of their time trying to cleanse all their data before they start to use it. And the reality is that if you can start to use it and what we would refer to as exercise it, when you exercise it, it gets, it gets cleaner as you exercise it. You, you could sit in perpetuity trying to make it perfect before you use it and you'll never make any progress. So the phenomena of what have you done for me when you're a year or longer and you've perpetuated it's coming at some point also lends itself to it's not credible because you're not moving fast enough. So that would be the other thing that I see as far as challenges is people just wanting their data to be perfect instead of starting to use it find the flaws, correct the flaws, run it again, and keep and keep iterating until you get to the point where you've established that credibility and can prove it. Great. So I'm going to do a time check where we have about 13 minutes left. I want to encourage people to put questions in the chat so we can field those. Um, so be thinking of what questions you might have for our panelists. Um, let's see here. So can, you, can each of you share how share an example of how people analytics has been successfully leveraged to solve a specific business challenge? Um, so um, Nate, Nayeli, if we can start with you and then go to Brad and then Nate. Yeah, so my favorite example was regarding overtime. So we were looking at overtime and we, we were just always paying like a lot of it and we always felt like understaffed and we couldn't like really get our head above the water, right? We just felt like we never had enough people. So then we decided to look into why, you know, that's kind of like the, the goal of people analytics to answer the question, why? Why is this happening? And we realized that uh, we were not giving enough hours to our full-time employees. So it's not that we needed to hire more people, it's that we needed to be better at scheduling our employees and giving them the 40 hours that they needed to work instead of like 20, 30 hours. So that was like, and I like this example because it's something that it could be obvious or it could be like simple once you say it or when you found out what was it. But at that point, it wasn't obvious until we started digging in. It's like, well, yeah, now it makes sense, um, you know, but that's kind of like encouraging, right? Because it doesn't have to be a huge problem. Uh, you can start with small things to get that momentum and and not be in this phase of like, okay, it, it, it's coming, it's coming. I'm going to have a deliverable 
next month or next quarter, you're going to see the value of people analytics. Like, you no, know, you can tackle something uh, attainable, something like smaller, and then present results. So that's why I like that example. Um, I'll tell a quick story about um, one of our customers. And this is, this is a story where people didn't realize that they had an issue. This was, they discovered it in their people analytics journey. It was a 20,000 employee financial services company. They began to look at the turnover in their organization. They looked at it at a very high level and they looked at it over time. And there wasn't anything obvious in terms of any turnover issues. But they began to look a little further under, under the hood. The emergency light hadn't come on. The check engine light hadn't come on yet. Um, but they started filtering that information in different ways. And they started to filter it on, OK, but we don't see turnover across the entire organization. Are, are there maybe subpopulations where we're experiencing something we just don't really recognize it? And so they started to look at specifically revenue producing roles within their organization. Nothing really profound came out of that. Then they looked at revenue producing roles and people who were high performers in those roles, because that's attributed to some level of accelerant revenue production for the organization. Nothing profound there. And then they filtered on women in those roles who were high performers. And all of a sudden they started to see an increase in turnover. And that was kind of an odd thing. They weren't really anticipating that. And they filtered it one more way. They looked at people in revenue producing roles, high performers, women in the age range of 25 to 35. And they discovered they had a huge turnover issue. And they're like, what the heck is going on here? Why is that occurring? So what they did is they actually went to their talent acquisition group and they say, what is this chronic turnover costing us as an organization, not only in terms of lost revenue, but actual costs for turnover and vacancies within the organization. And they came up with a number for that. And then they asked other women in their organization why this might be occurring. And what they ultimately identified was that they had a maternity benefits issue within the organization. And they were able to go to the total rewards leader and say, we've got a maternity benefits issue and here's, and here's what we would suggest that be done. And they were able to use the data from the TA group that says, here's what it's costing us to have to go recruit, re-recruit these positions. And it costs us X amount of dollars to do that. But here's the incremental cost for changing our maternity benefits. And they made a business case out of it. They put new maternity benefits in, they looked at it a year later and it began to harmonize. So this was just a great example of looking and diagnosing data and coming up with a solution and using a business logic and rationale to make a recommendation for how they would change maternity benefits within an organization. Quite interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. really interesting. Um, I'll be quick because I know we're short on time, but my favorite example that I wanted to share was is, is my favorite because its beauty is in its sort of simplicity um, and you know not getting up and trying to overcomplicate the problem at hand. So I'll speak to reducing first-year turnover um, at, at a healthcare organization that you help. And we knew that was a strategic goal. So our, our job was to basically holistically analyze our first year turnover problem. So who's leaving and why are they leaving? And so throughout that process, we discovered a couple of things and learning a lot about why people choose to leave the company in their first year. One specific example that or trend that we found was that people didn't feel like they were in the job that they signed up for, right? So the importance of a realistic job review on the front end. So um, adjusting our talent acquisition process accordingly there. But what was so cool about this particular example is we found that managers, the ones, the people who can actually influence, you know, somebody's decision to leave, they don't even know who's on their first, on their team, who's in their first year, right? So they, they, it's great that they know why people are leaving, but they have such large teams, oftentimes a hundred direct reports that they can't, keep track in a meaningful way of who's even like eligible to be a first year term, right? And so um, our, our solution to that was to create sort of a really easy to look at sort of roadmap for managers to access that showed 
who was in their first year at different sort of tenure points along the way and some corresponding activities that would benefit that person's first year experience. Like, hey, at six months, you know, have, have you or somebody on your team check in with them about career development. And so, um, you know, being in people analytics, our, our, uh, our sort of like itch in the beginning was to try to overcomplicate things with maybe like, you know, complex stats around who's leaving and why, but really all it was, was giving managers a better idea of who was on their team and how long had they been there and what, to, what to do about it. So. Perfect. Thank you. Well, this has been a really great um, conversation, I think, that we've had. So to, to start kind of wrapping up, if each of our panelists can give, you know, a sentence or two of what advice would you give our audience that are kind of new in this people analytic strategy? Um, so let's see, we'll start with Nayeli, then go to Nate and then finish up with Brad. Well, my advice will be don't feel intimidated. We all started at some point, and one of my favorite phrases is, don't be afraid to suck at something new, <laughs> because we all have. Anytime that you are a beginner, you're going to be bad at it because you're learning, but then you become really good at being a beginner, a lot of things, right? So just mm -hmm. don't be afraid. Um, there are a lot of uh, resources out there. I'm going to share uh, some resources with Amanda so she can send them to you guys. Um, like I say, Kate McNold in um, just like data cam, like you can find anything and you can also reach out to me directly if you have any questions on how to start uh, and I'll be happy to help you guys. So just don't feel intimidated. Nate? I love that answer, Nayeli. Um, mine is simple. Um, I, you know, if you, if you have the opportunity to work on a problem that's maybe even people analytics adjacent, if it's data related at all, my recommendation would just be to, you know, at the end of that analysis, lead with the takeaway and get into the details if it's necessary. Um, as a data person, I want people to love the data but they often don't. And so leading with the bottom line, getting into the details if necessary. Brad? Um, two, two things. One, and back to Nate's topic, I think a little bit, understand what business issue you're trying to solve for. That will That is the best first path for you to go down. Um, and that's not always an easy thing because people don't uh, often understand what they're trying to solve for. Mm -hmm. I think the second one is do your best to not fall prey to starting people analytics to measure HR's effectiveness. Because <clears throat> there are a lot of people that don't give a flip about HR's effectiveness. They want to understand what you're going to do to influence the business. So trying to understand what the ratios are of HR business partners to X number of people in your organization, while that's interesting information for most people, they're going to say, I don't know what to do with that. That's going to have really much effect on the organization. So understand what business questions or business issues you're trying to solve for and align data to try to answer those kinds of things. And don't become so centric that you just want to measure HR's performance as opposed to the business's performance. Those would be my advice. Perfect. Well, thank you. Well, we are coming to the end of our time. It's been a great session. So we appreciate those that have joined. Um, I will, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but if there is, feel free to pop them up and we'll see what we can answer quickly. Um, I will also add that you can find the Hacking HR team as well as our panelists on LinkedIn. So don't be afraid to, to look us up. Um, you know, we're, we're a team out there. So with that said, I'm still not seeing any questions. So I will wrap it up with there. So we appreciate everybody's time. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Nice to see you. Everyone. Take care.